Hello everyone, I'm Annie Gibbons and you're listening to Memoirs of Successful Women, the podcast where you get to hear candid conversations with fascinating women from around the globe who share aspects of their business and life journey, how they measure their success and what they have learnt along the way. Hello and welcome to Memoirs of Successful Women. Today I have the delight of introducing you to Emma Jane Taylor, who is the CEO of The Works Company, which is a series of lifestyle businesses. She's also the author of Don't Hold Back. She's a CBT practitioner. She's also on Talk the Taboo and The Wellbeing Show and Power Hour. And I am delighted to welcome her to my program today. Welcome, Emma Jane. Oh, thanks, Annie. It's lovely to be here with you. Thank you. So you've had, uh, it's an absolute delight. So you've had a huge year this year. You have been named, I think you've been nominated for Giving Back uh, with Women Business Award. You've been named Inspirational Woman, Influential Woman. So how does it feel to be at that stage of your career to start off with? I would say quite humbling, actually, Annie. You know, I uh, I think any kind of award that is given to you or you're nominated for is a huge, huge accolade to where you are in your life. Mm. I've had lots of nominations. I've been very privileged over the years with the awards. Um, But I think it's this year, the 2021 award that has been the biggest one for me. It's been the most humbling one. It's the Giving Back Award I'm nominated for. And for me, with my life journey, with where I've come from, where I'm going to, this is the one that means the most in, in every way. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And so how are you giving back? What is that that award? What's the sort of the reasoning behind that award? How do you how do we how does the world know what Emma Jane is doing to give back to the community that you're in? So my I, I give back in various ways. I mean, my main my main giving back is giving a platform um, to voices. So, you know, giving people who aren't heard a chance to be heard, giving people who are experiencing difficulties the chance to share those difficulties, to make a difference to the other people suffering in silence, to help people feel safe to 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 give something back to the many struggling in silence and and help people understand that they're not alone. And I think that is my biggest platform is to help people know that they are not alone. I felt alone for so many of my years, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that. But, you know, my my vulnerable years were, were all of that. You know, I didn't feel heard. I didn't have someone to talk to. I didn't feel listened to. I was struggling in silence. I didn't have a voice. I was nervous and I had some very difficult times facing me. But I'm not alone. Many people out there, boys and girls, men and women, are struggling in silence. And we need to hear these voices. We need to let them know it is okay, that they are okay. We are safe. We are going to look after you. And we need to put some more protection around people. And I guess that is my biggest thing. I'm giving people that chance, that space, that opportunity to feel safe, to give back and feel protected themselves by the work that I'm doing and the work that they're doing. Mm. I love that on so many levels. And that's and for those people who say, wow, is there a rush on almost of people having their stories and people needing their voice heard? The message is, well, yes and yes and no. Yes, that we're giving now a platform, and that is such a great thing. But no, there's not a rush on. These people always had their voice. They always needed to share their story. And the fact that people Uh, didn't hear that or weren't receptive to that or they didn't feel that they had the opportunity for that I mean that's the saddest thing isn't it you know when you when you aren't heard and you are suffering in silence you know it's not surprising uh, that you know you're passionate and I'm passionate as well about people being able to go you know whatever's happened to you in life please share that with someone so that we can actually help you believe Mm. you support you and all of those all of those things. yeah uh, oh gosh absolutely and I think you know certainly as a child going through very many difficulties I thought that's just what I had to do was go through those difficulties face that as I did and, and stay silent without a voice but it's absolutely not the case you know I was asked um, by a BBC3 documentary here in the UK 
what were my regrets mm. or what are my regrets? And I don't like to have regrets. I think we, we face everything for, the, for, for a reason. But if I, I had to give an answer and my regret was that I didn't speak up sooner, would yeah. it have changed anything? Who knows? Would it have made my life any different? Who knows? But I could have done something sooner. Mm. Mm. And I think that's a really important point for people to take away is, you know, you, you're not alone. You do have a voice and, and you don't have to use it on the scale that I use it, you know, uh, and the events that I do on in TV, magazines, national newspapers. You can simply find a friend, find a therapist, put a text together and tell somebody or write a letter. There are ways that you can share your messages and however you share them, you've got to be safe in the knowledge of who's reading them will be the right person for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And that's a good point to make that not everyone has to be a champion for, for no. those, you know, of that cause. And, you know, often it's kind of like, oh, well, I don't, I don't then want to become the public voice of, and you don't have to be all it's Oh about, gosh, no. You know, most people aren't. And that's the reality, you know, that when, you know, many people that I interview on this show, once again, will say that exactly what you just said, that they should have said earlier, that the only regrets are I should have, should have come out mm. earlier with this information. Uh, but but the majority, actually, it's just about having their their message heard, their truth heard, and feeling supported at that time, you know. And that's that's worth gold, right? Yeah. So so let's unpack your story then. You wrote in "Don't Hold Back" your your whole story. So you have shared that with the world, and it started uh, from from the text of when you were sexually abused at age nine, very young age, and and the consequences after that throughout, you know, your life, particularly your early teens and the trauma of that and obviously not having your voice heard, uh, sending you on a downward spiral, you know, definitely through your education onto drugs and, and eating disorders and so forth until, you know, the early 20s really. Uh, how Share, if you may, on, on that experience and what you went through just so that others can relate uh, a little bit to the context of what we're discussing. Yeah, and if I may, Annie, I'm going to go back a little bit further, I think, because my whole picture is really, you could understand it better or maybe not. You know, I remember probably my earliest memory was when I was about two or three years old. I lived with my mum and my stepfather my two brothers from time to time my step siblings would come and visit we had a cat called honey and that was my life you know that was my normal life I was happy mm. I used to go and visit my my father every other weekend he would pick me up he would take me horse riding we'd go and watch um, Bruce Forsyth's generation game when they were in the UK we'd go to the sweet shop Percy Lovejoy's sweet shop uh, and it was just fun 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 yeah. Everything about those younger years for me was happy. I wasn't unhappy. I had a nice family situation. I had a, 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 just a lot of goodness around me. Mm. So when we went on holiday, when I was nine years old, um, we went overseas and I was assaulted. It was the first time that I really had experienced anything bad. And up until that point, I was just a, a happy child, enjoying animals, enjoying life, enjoying friends. And, you know, this situation came to me when the restaurant owner who had befriended the family on holiday was taking the children out to see the animals. And I innocently went. My parents let me go. There was other families there we'd got friends with. It just seemed an OK situation. Uh, and then this one night he took us out into uh, into the light where the animals were. And like I say, I was an animal lover and I was just happy to be there. And he just moved me, not a, not very far, just moved me slightly away from the other my other friends and the other children. And I could still see the taverna. You know, we weren't that far away from the taverna. You could still hear the laughing, the plates being thrown, the dancing, the singing. Everything about that night was happy. And then he took me out into the into the shadows and assaulted me. It, and, it, and it didn't last very long. It was over before I knew it. I didn't know what it was. I had no experience of sexual um, sexual education. I didn't know what sexual abuse meant. I didn't know what just happened to me. So I never spoke about it. I remember running back into the restaurant. I remember hot fitting it in there at, with a racing heart. Mm. But that was it. 
I never spoke about it. And so life just continued. That happy, wonderful life that I had was still there. It was, I think there was a little chink in the armor, but it wasn't, it wasn't denting me hugely at that point. It was just there. It was an awareness. And then one weekend, my lovely father, you know, this guy, my handsome father, he was my prince. He was, he was just everything to me. You know, I loved this man so much. And, uh, he took me to the horse riding stables, but I noticed on this occasion, he only took me and my two brothers were standing at the window and looking sad. And then this particular day, he said, look, you know, I, uh, I have a problem one of the weekends. I'm due to see you and we need to talk that through. He pulled in, in a lay by and we had this long chat. And again, I was only 11. I mean, I, I didn't really have any, any conversation or uh, awareness of you know, what he, I didn't have any words really. I just went horse riding and then came back. And then he said to me, I'll call you tomorrow and let's, let me find out what you want to do. So he gave me that responsibility. He gave me, um, he gave me ownership of Mm. his problem. And I didn't work that out till much later. So he called me the next night, he dropped me home on the Sunday. He called me that night. He said, you know, what's your decision? And uh, I said, look, you know, I want to see mummy on this weekend, this Mother's Day weekend, but I don't want to stop seeing you, daddy. And he said, well, you've made your choice. And that was it. He put the phone down and, and that was it. So, you know, this, this wonderful little bubble that I lived in suddenly was massively damaged. I ran out of the house. I was, I was beyond upset I mean just beyond and and someone like your father your your the love of my life ripped my soul my heart my my very being out of me and that was it I mean that was that was 37 years ago I've not seen him since so I went through a lot of turmoil a lot of wrangle and uh I I kind of went from this really nice child into a very depressed very sad very lonely my, my schooling, I went from a nice child into a horror, a monster. Um, I was isolated at school. I was suspended regularly. I was put into to school psychiatry, labelled a juvenile delinquent, went on daily report. I was often told I was a failure, the girl going nowhere. I started, as you said in the intro, I was taking drugs. I was drinking. I became bulimic. I had OCD. I suffered with terrible night terrors and fear of being abandoned. And I was really worried about what I might say to other people because I was worried that I might lose them from my life. Mm. I was const- constantly needing to go for a wee. I was panicky, paranoid, late developer, anxiety, I, everything. <laughs> yeah. It, it, just, it just triggered me. And then um, out, out of the darkness came a family friend who just became the father I never had. But it was more than that he didn't just become my friend. He groomed me. He sexually abused me. He degraded me. He tortured me. He manipulated me. And, and and all of those, all of that drinking and drugs and bulimia and OCD and night terrors, it all just magnified. And I was a problem child. And, uh, you know, when you kind of look back, it's, it's easy to see in hindsight, right? It's easy to have these conversations in hindsight, but at the time I just had no clue what was going on. Everybody around me clearly saw the change in me, but they just assumed it was because of my father, which it was in many ways, but it was far yeah. deeper than that. And, and that, that was really my life, Annie, you know, um, from, from nine till I stepped away from my abuser when I was about 16, 17. But I'm sure you were aware that, you know, by then trauma bonding has set in. Yeah. And it's very difficult when you're very vulnerable and you've been rejected and abandoned by you know, the big figure in your life. It's very difficult to walk away from people because you're fearful of what might happen next. Yeah. Exactly. And so I stayed in that world. I stayed in that world 16, 17, when boys started coming along. And, and yeah, so that's when I started stepping away. So in essence, that was my, my, my nine years really of mm. or six, or eight years of, of difficulties when it all started off so nicely, it all just, it was like dominoes. Yeah, exactly. Wow. It's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it is hard to fathom, but the, the sad reality is it happens far too often as we know. Oh, 
and all the time you know and that's it once you are that you know particularly later in in your journey when you were were groomed you know they're doing it deliberately they know you're the perfect person to to groom and therefore they get away with it the the most mm. amazing um reality is that other people don't ask more you know and i found that in my my own personal journey as well that you know you're thinking well when you go from a very happy go lucky child to you know, on a downward spiral, then why aren't more people asking why? You know, it's such an easy, it, you know, on reality, that's right. It is terrible that your father seemed to think it was all in or nothing, you know, and that's his journey and his choice and his major cost um, and sad impact and consequence on you. But it's amazing that more people don't ask, you know, is it more or they just assume, oh, it's because of this reason, you know, they don't ask more questions. And that's, you know, have you thought about that more? You know, didn't they didn't they realise? Why don't they ask? Because a child, it's very hard for a child to think, oh, well, I'm going to tell them this information when you don't even know what's happening really yourself. You don't know what's right and what's wrong and it just feels un, uncomfortable and it feels wrong. But surely if those in authority knew that, they would be asking more questions, right? Yeah, so look, I'm now a child sex abuse activist. Mm. Um, and a lot of these questions come up all the time you know it's not you, we need to we need to see better from what we hear mm. and hear better with what we see because we we just we haven't done over you know we're in the 21st century now right yeah you know the 20th century uh children me being one of them we didn't have these conversations we weren't aware we weren't but we are now but the yeah. trouble is now well not only are we aware we've also got the difficulties of social media and the presence of online uh difficulties for young people mm. so the talking is done in a very different way but recognizing it is really important so i'm i'm actually working on another book at the moment and that is really focused on this conversation and wow. what we can do as society to to understand better what is going on around us because it's really important interestingly my school friends of that that those sort of 11 to 16 years old I left school at 16 being told I was a failure being told I was the girl going nowhere and of course I believed that didn't really felt like I'd left with any friends um, and just went off into my career as the failure and actually, I've reconnected with them in the last six months, and none of them were aware of my story until now. But now, it's clear as day to them, right? You know, one of my friends said, I remember you shaking and constantly being sick. I just thought that was the way you were. Mm. But realizing now, and she, and she was really upset, actually. She was really sad. And I said to her, look, it's not your fault. It's no one's fault. It's just the, just the way we were as kids. Mm. Um, and a couple of other people came up saying, you know, you were so naughty at school. You were never horrible to chill other chill other girls. You were just very naughty. <laughs> and I've been trying to wrap my brains of what that red flag was. And then it came to me, that was it. That is the red flag, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's hard to believe now of, of, of us now as, as professional women, how we could have been that person, because usually people associate um, how you are back then with how you are now and of course that's not true at all wow. um, and so there's been a big big change but it's recognizing those signs and I think going back to your question of that it's talking more it's understanding better you know my mom and my stepfather and my family aren't bad people hmm. they just aren't armed with the education I'm a mother now I'm constantly on my daughter how are you what's going on uh, yeah. if she says uh, yeah mommy I'm good but you know what Oh, don't worry about it. Yes, well, I am going to worry about it. Yeah. What is that but uh, her butt? <laughs> let's talk, let's just talk that her butt through. Yeah. And um, so yeah, so I've become much more aware from my story. And I'm sharing that through the work that I do um, in my in my business, in my industry, but also as a child sex abuse activist. Um, and because these are important conversations to have, it it's recognizing what we need to do as a society. Yeah. A hundred percent, hundred percent, Emma Jane. I love that because that's exactly it. In in our day, I suppose you know, and even in my my story, I went from top of the class in year six to then bottom of the class in year seven with eating disorder and the massive changes happening as a result of sexual assault. And the fact that no one asks why, you know, it must be just for a understandable reason or they didn't feel comfortable. Whereas now we're in a different time, and you know, I think yes. that 
thing. You know, you suddenly go, yeah, there'll be ebbs and flows and we'll all get, you know, have our, you know, have our not so, not so pleasant moments in life and that's normal. But it's not normal to see massive changes, you know, massive, you know, shifts and, and particularly when, when children have had a nature of a certain type and then have really shifted, you know, and I think that's exactly it is to call it out. You know, it's better to go, I was over, overprotective or over caring than Absolutely. not care at all. You know, it's kind of like going, you know, I'm a bit concerned. I am here for you. You know, if, if there is something I, you know, I'm happy to, to, to listen to you, you know, yes. no, no judgment, right? Um, because that's what we didn't have. And that's exactly right. And good on you for campaigning for that, that we need to be, you know, just a lot more vigilant to, to support to support people in those in those times absolutely so, so how did you at age 17 when you finish this downward spiral which has gone on for years and you then at the end of there going well I might as well leave school and people are telling you that you know you're never going to amount for anything how did you then suddenly I know you ended up in Spain at a time in your journey and then suddenly you ended up you know creating businesses and getting into fitness and wellness and bits and pieces how, what happened to you? What was that shift or moment or series of events that went and said, you know what, I am actually worth more than this. I need to rise above this circumstance to find who I truly am. Uh, well, it wasn't easy, Annie, as I'm sure you know. Um, none of this has been easy. It's it, it, There wasn't the light switch moment. It was a lot of thought and process. So um, yes, when I was 17, 18, PTSD started catching up on me. I didn't know what PTSD meant. I just didn't. I just knew I was feeling really sad and all those all those emotions we were talked about earlier, the, the, the bulimia, the OCD, they just got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. I was kind of out of control in myself. Um, I left school with nothing really. I tried a bit of hairdressing. I tried a bit of temping. I was just, you know, I was the failure. One thing I really loved was dancing, dancing. I, I, I'm a trained dancer and uh, I've danced in, in some, you know, amazing places over my life. And that was kind of the thing that grounded me was being able to dance, you know, being able to f- perform. And anyone who's gone through difficulties um, and has been in the performing arts arena will tell you how it's really helped them. That creative side was a really mm-hmm. big part of them. But, you know, I, I needed to change and you know, I was all over the place. And, uh, you know, boys had started coming in and showing fancy, you know, fancying me. And I, I kind of I, I wasn't really sure. I was quite nervous about relationships. I had a few friends around, but still didn't talk. Then I got the opportunity, like you say, to go to Spain and, and work as a nanny. So I kind of I, fl- I, I flipped back and forth from the UK doing that. And uh, one year I just went around Spain. I think it was in my, when I was 21. I, was, I went to Spain when I was 19. And um, in between, I would come back and work in bars and clubs back in the UK. And then one year I just literally drank myself around Spain <laughs> and uh, came back and I was shaking and I thought, you know what, this, I don't, I don't like this. I, I, I didn't feel good. And um, I was working in a bar. These were a couple of po- poignant moments in my life. And uh, this, the punter came in, one of the punters, his name was Chris. And I, I still talk about him now. And, and he doesn't, has no recollection of this conversation, but I do. He said to me, EJ, you know, really, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I want to be a dancer. <laughs> and he was laughing. I said, why are you laughing? He said, you're just never going to be a dancer or running your own business. I said, why? Hmm. He said, because you are just out partying all the time. You're always taking drugs. You're just, you're just crazy. And it was sort of like that. Oh my goodness. Is that my legacy? Yeah. The the drunken bum, the the drug ad, you know, and I was like, no, 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 this is, this isn't what I want. And and I guess when I was 19, my, viol- uh, my stepfather had a heart operation. Now, up until this point, I hated this man. I hated everybody. Let me, let me be clear. I hated everybody in my life. I was angry. I was full of hurt. I was full of pain. I was distorted. And I, I couldn't see straight. And then I got a call to say my stepfather had been taken into hospital. And it really stopped me again in my tracks because this man had given me a roof over my head since I was two. 
He'd effectively brought me up and, you know, he'd been behind a lot of the difficulty conversations with my biological father. I do remember distinctively him saying, don't do this to your children. Hmm. And I hated him. You know, I was violent towards him. I was just nasty and horrible. Um, And again, you know, that was, that was, that was me. That wasn't him. That was me. And so we were faced with him being in hospital and he was in London. So I, I ran, ran, I sort of got grabbed a train, got up to London as quick as I could. And, and, and I, I walked into the room and I was shocked by, by Annie. I was just so shocked. Here is this, this man, lovely man who'd been kind and gracious and caring to me. All of my life was lying there on this hospital bed full of wires and beeps and drips and it just looked terrible and it it my heart just just I don't know I just just sunk and uh it was a real awakening for me I was like oh my goodness this man is the only man who's ever loved me Mm. who's ever only ever cared for me he's only ever wanted what's right he's he's taken the hits he's taken the violence he's taken the, the 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 distressing stuff he didn't need to do any of that right and he did Mm. and not just with me but I mean the complications around the the whole of our family and he took it and why did he take it well he clearly loved us Mm. and suddenly it, it was like this big change and I I remember looking at him saying please don't die please don't die. I love you so much. I am so sorry for everything. I, I need to, I need to go and, and sort myself out. I need to go and, and make a change. I need, I, I need to do this, but I can't do it without you. Hmm. And I sat with him for 48 hours. I didn't leave his bed and I just cried, held his hand. We watched, we have a pro, I don't know if you've heard of dad's army, but he loved dad's <laughs> army. Yeah. And he started coming around the next, the 24 hours after I first saw him. And, uh, I remember my mother being in the room and and I said, look, I'm going to stay and watch dad's army. And I just cuddled him and, and it was such a powerful moment. And he said, he's always thanked me for that and said it was a real turning point for him in his recovery. Mm. And it was that time, Annie, that I thought that's this is it. I need to do something. And that was around the time that I thought of like went back and forth to Spain. And then I came back and I rang up a therapist And I said, I need to see you. I rang up a therapist out of town Mm. because I didn't want to bump into her. But it was a turning point for me. It was when I went, right, I need to do something. I need to own this and not hurt people who love me. Uh, And it was, and it, and it, it was, that was part of my next phase. And that wasn't easy taking that call. It wasn't easy. It was like someone just softened my black heart, that darkness inside me and turned things around and there was light. There was a new, there was a glimmer of hope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was that hope that made me take that step, take that step into therapy. I remember my first therapy session and I think I cried for an hour. And um, there was a lot of pain. And, you know, you're, vic- you're a victim, right? You felt, I felt like a victim. I, don't, I no longer feel like a victim. But I felt like a victim. And... I needed to put my puzzle back together. My life was a mess. I mean, it was car crash. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know really who my friends were. I didn't, I had no direction. I missed my dancing. And so my therapy started and, and, you know, while that was starting, I decided to start a adult dance class. And it was from here that life just started changing. Wow. Because you suddenly found, yeah, what you loved, what you always always knew you loved, right? So there's no sudden surprise there. It's actually just permission to do what you what you love and see where you that will take you and yeah. and others on your journey. Wow, yeah. the value of therapy and the message that it's you know it's never too late. That's right, and it's got to be at the right time. You know, I imagine if people had said you should go to therapy even six months before, a year before, you would have went no way. You know, it's no. got to be the right time. Yeah, well, I was thrown into um, psychi- psychiatric care when I was I don't know thirteen, fourteen at school, and I was just like, yeah, whatever. I, yeah. I mean, just just wasn't interested I mean I just sat in this room I remember these clinic it was a clinical room 
me, a microphone and my therapist. Mm. And I remember sitting there with my hands underneath my, <laughs> my legs and I was just like, yeah, whatever. No, yeah. Just, I, I didn't care because I didn't know how to. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. And you didn't also, it's also a belief of, of what's possible, right? You care when you have hope that things are, are possible for you, that there's a really, yeah. there's an empowered future, right? And, and you and I both are, are into that. And so that's right. When you're at that state and you go, well, I've lost everything that was of value to me and I'm not feeling, I'm actually not feeling anymore. So that, at that time, it's not surprising that you don't respond because you kind of go, well, to what, you know, that's... Mm. I think we need to remember that, that troubled time for, for teens and particularly when you've had that, that taken away from you. So I love what you did. You, you leaned into your dancing, which is what you loved, and then through that you then went, expanded your fitness repertoire, if you like. And so was yes. that because you actually went, not only do I love dancing, I love all of you know general fitness and well-being as well or is it because in a business opportunity there's you know it's it's a collective what was that for you uh it was it was I, i'm very passion driven and um for me start, starting those dance classes one dance class in fact um i'm celebrating well i when i started those dance classes it was 25 years ago that they still go on now and some of the members are still there with with wow. new teachers i have a new team of teachers now um and they're still there. And, and it, it's such a lovely feeling. But, you know, I started that, that dance class and it was liberating. Like I say, I was temping, I was doing office jobs, I was doing jobs I hated. And I was just like, right, that's it. I'm just going to focus on the stuff that makes me happy. Mm. And it kind of went align with the therapy. In fact, I was, in fact, one thing I did forget to mention, my, ther my therapist, the first time I spoke to her, she did a lot of Reiki as well. And well, this is one of my therapists. I've had millions. And uh, she said to me, EJ, go home and eat some walnuts. They're really good for the heart. And I remember going home and all I did was eat walnuts for weeks <laughs> <laughs> because I, I really I just felt that I believed it. Right. I, I mean, it, it, whether I, I mean, I, I just really embraced anything that anyone told me that was good. <laughs> And, uh, and, and these walnuts, every time I see a walnut, I think, oh, it's good for my heart. Oh, that's so, um, so yeah, so I started my dance classes and I did some work in schools actually teaching dance and that was just beautiful. I mean, just mm -hmm. beautiful, just to see children enjoying stuff that I had enjoyed, even through some of the, my difficult years was just, just a beautiful thing. Mm. I stopped drinking, I stopped taking drugs. I also stepped away from the circle of life I was living with the people mm. I was living. And they, now I'm not suggesting for one minute they were bad people. They just weren't right for my life because what they were doing was allowing me to put a veil over me to, yeah. to, to, to cover up my difficulties. And so by stepping away and doing the dance, it allowed this veil to come up mm. and it allowed me to start, you know, it's a bit like the daisies start coming up, you know, the sun starts yeah. shining in it. And it just felt, you know, a real beautiful moment. While I was doing my dancing, I, I was very interested in fitness. And then I decided, actually, you know, if I'm going to go out and do any kind of business, this is probably a good attachment, a hand in glove. Mm. And so I went and got all the qualifications you can think are manageable um, from my from the fitness industry and uh, got very highly qualified with nutrition and weight management as well and so the two worked together I was asked to choreograph a show but and it suddenly like those next two years felt like they were really nourishing yeah I felt nourished by dance I love dance one of my specialities is tap dancing I was able to teach I think like five tap classes we had three dance classes they were mine. It was just me, me doing that with a new community. Mm. And it, no one knew my story. I didn't obviously share my story. Mm. I had some great mentors coming behind me in the fitness industry and also in the performing arts industry and my therapy and my recovery. I call it my recovery years. These, this yeah. was the start of my recovery years. And they didn't just happen in one week, two weeks, 12 weeks. There were years and years yeah. and years of recovery. Yeah. Um, and then when I was 26, um, two years after so I started my adult dance classes, I opened, oh, sorry, when I was 27, I opened my own performing arts school for children. 
And this is for children aged four to 16. And it was just me, a colleague and 20 kids. Wow. And this year we're celebrating 21 years in business. We have like four or 500 members. I have a great big team around that. But I did that. I did that with some great support and people behind me. I then really pushed into the fitness when I was in sort of my 27, 27 to 30 years and developed that. I developed a big, big client base and really, really enjoyed that part. I started employing a few people at this time, getting people behind the business. I had no agenda, Annie. I didn't start to kind of think, you know, I'm going to be talking to Annie Gibbons one day, sharing my personal story. <laughs> I never thought I'd talk about my story. I just wanted to live. I just wanted to yeah. be that be that girl before nine years old, which was very happy. Yeah. And and I was becoming that, you know, I was becoming that. And uh, then I put together some uh, timetable on the new on the fitness stuff. Um, my daughter was born and when I was 36 years old. And it was just like things were really coming together. You know, my, my life felt strong. My personal life felt strong. My, my world around me was nice. It was full of performing arts and good people and fitness. I hadn't been drinking and taking anything for like six years, like 10 years by the time my daughter had come. I was feeling really healthy, but not just physically, mentally and emotionally. I was feeling much stronger. And then it was here that I was asked to um, be interviewed. Someone, I was asked if I would be interviewed on a local TV station, on Next TV, about my business story. And I guess it was around this time. I think I was probably about 40 now. So, you know, we're talking nearly, nearly 16 years after the therapy had begun. My business was established. My team was established. And it just all felt good. And But one thing didn't didn't feel good is that even though I was doing all this therapy I kind of hadn't talked about it mm. and I hadn't got a burning desire to talk about it let me put it that way yeah um the the tv company came in and said look can we interview you as a, a local businesswoman you've clearly done very well over the last sort of 15 16 years I said yeah yeah you know I'm happy to be interviewed well quite exciting as well yeah, very. and uh, yeah so I went in and it was it was nerve-wracking to start with but this guy interviewed me and he was brilliant absolutely brilliant yeah. and then after the interview they said you know what EJ there's a girl going on maternity leave you clear and she's she does the health health fitness shows um you've clearly got a lot of knowledge would you consider coming and doing like a maternity cover just for a month or so and I said yeah yeah happy okay. to do that yeah four years later they'd <laughs> given me my own show the well-being show and everything had pushed on yeah. everything had pushed on but the one thing that hadn't pushed on was I still had a little bit of thought around my my personal story I was now seen as a very successful woman mm. and when I say yes I was I don't see it as a monetary thing mm. I don't see that I don't see anything that I've achieved in life as monetary I see it now right here having this conversation and the mental emotional and physical impact it's had on my life mm. this is the biggest success to be able to be yeah. authentic so I'm interviewing all these people on TV and uh, talking about their stories, their real life situations. And I go home thinking, gosh, all these people. And, and of course, no one sees the, this side of my difficult life. And it suddenly just, just felt like I needed to share that story. And I didn't know how, just didn't mm -hmm. know how. And then uh, Venus Women magazine, out of nowhere, came up and found me. They, they, they um, headhunted me and they said, look, we're doing... Um, we'd like you to feature on the front cover of our magazine for our summer edition, because, you know, you're clearly someone who would be inspirational for women. And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, we're, I'm happy to. And they did a six page article on me. Um, and the picture was the, the very iconic picture now of me in that pink chair. Yeah. And I said, um, I said, but you know, life hasn't always been this easy. There was a difficult side of my personal story. I would like to touch on that. And they <laughs> said, yeah. So I touched on my personal story in this magazine. It was very, you know, I haven't, I had, have a, I've had some personal difficulties and, you know, how, life hasn't been easy, that kind of. Yeah. And then they said, you know what, EJ, it'd be really good if you elaborated on this. Could we film you doing it? And on the, and then they've got an event coming up later that year. Could yeah. I be the compare and have 
my personal story shared in the event and I thought oh you know what just go for it yes yeah I didn't really sort of give it too much thought yeah until I realized the event was at a football stadium there was going to be about <laughs> 400 500 people in the room and my story was going all around the screens before I came on stage <laughs> and my parents were there my friends yes. were there on a the table with, and they had no a, idea well they did obviously I, I had spoken to yeah. them when I was in my early when my therapy started I, I started talk, talking to my parents so they were aware, but it's still very difficult, right? As a parent, I understand that. Yeah. Anyway, these screens came up, the event started, and they introduced me as the compare and, and the front cover of their magazine. And on the videography, I, four, all I can remember is four great big screens was me and my story. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, what have <laughs> I done? And the chaperone saying that my music play, this girl is on fire, was my theme to walk down the runway onto the stage. And I said to my chaperone, I, I must be crazy. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't do this. Wow. And my chaperone said, you have to, EJ, you have to. This yeah. is it. This is your time. Do it. Do this. And I had a, I had a bit of sick in my throat. <laughs> and as I walked down the runway, I was shaking. When I got on stage, I was shaking. And I started my speech. I was shaking. And then I stopped. And I just said, you know what? I've never spoken about this on a public scale like this. I mean, I speak all the time in my business. It's just yeah. the nature of my business. But when it was about my personal story, it just, yeah. I was just not comfortable at that point, but I did it. Wow. The room just went, oh. Yeah. And so many people, Annie, contacted me over that night and the next day to say, thank you. You've mm -hmm. really opened the door for me to go and have therapy and I always said if I could have one person then yeah. it would have all been worth it and that's where really then why the book came around you know when I was 45 years old so you know we're talking about you know only a few years ago four years ago three years ago now so in 2018 I had my book published mm. and it's called don't hold back it's my story and it's how I've got through my difficulties to be the woman I, I am today yeah and I've always said if it can help one person it would have been the right thing to have done yeah and it was hard putting all this stuff on paper right because you know I would have been happily just said I'm Emma Jane Taylor I've gone through some very personal difficulties and this is how I've come out of it yeah my author friend he's a very well-known author he said EJ you, you people you need you need to be credible and people really need to get behind who you are and they're not going to do it with that and so it took a few attempts and then I eventually put down on paper my book went out there and over the last three years it's just been oh, wow I mean the book has been read across the world I've got women men boys girls contacting me from all over the world Southeast Asia Australia Canada Dubai Europe um, Africa I mean everywhere it's amazing uh, people, yes and you know what's truly amazing is how prevalent this is yeah I always knew it was, I knew I, I know I'm one in a million or billion or whatever it is but really it's frightening yeah it's frightening that there are so many kids out there struggling so many kids afraid to speak up and my story has really helped them um, and for that, that, that for me is a good thing. So I, I've, I went from there on to becoming a radio presenter. I still run those, my two businesses, Stage Works and Nutritious Works. I have a, a lovely team. I have an admin team. I have two PAs. Um, and we work really hard keeping yeah. that business together. But now on the other side of that is, is the work that I'm doing now as an author. I'm, a, uh, I, I'm represented as a speaker. Um, my story has been out all over the world. I work with um, Talk with Taboo. I work on radio shows. And now I give a platform for other people as well. And mm. I think that's a really important part for me. And, and just in this last year, my second book has started to, started to be written. And I never thought I'd write another book. Mm. I was at the end of 2020, a grandma, and my story was in the national press here in the UK um, and, and, and all over the world, I guess. And um, a grandma on the back of it wrote to my PA and said, would EJ write another book? Mm. Uh, because actually she's got some great lessons that could help so many people now and in the generations to come. I said, forget it. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. And here I am six months later, thick into a book, 
it's, I've become a child sex abuse activist. I've just um, accepted a role on an advisory board that works with sex offenders and survivors because I believe we need to understand. Mm. I have, you know, I, I, the, the, this isn't about putting sex offenders anywhere, but understanding and getting knowledge because we need yeah. to, to work out what, what we're missing. And that, that for me is a real, real big part of the work. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I've got some really exciting opportunities coming up, which I can't really talk about yet because they, they haven't been signed and sealed, but um, all my work now is really about giving back, giving people a voice, giving a platform, letting people be heard and supporting the many struggling in silence. But more than that, Annie, mm. I want to give back to the people who haven't been touched. And mm. I want those to have valuable lessons that um, I can share so they can sleep at night. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, my goodness. Your journey is so powerful because you, that's right, you've got to the dream now that it's all, it is all about giving. It is all about helping others. It is all about the platform while still running your own businesses, which are your your natural passion right if you didn't have yeah. all this trauma which we hope we actually hope people don't have then that would have been your journey right so you found you know your your purpose and your in your natural talents to be able to build those businesses despite which is super impressive uh amazing and it shows also that story that yeah that's right even if you didn't do everything perfect at school you can still go on and become an entrepreneur and grow businesses and make things happen so never limit yourself is that a message in the story but it also shows that you know when you do that and as you get older when there's things that you feel that you can give back because they are so powerful to you they are so real and you go well I can use my story to um, empower others to be able to you know have that confidence because it's an incredible boldness and confidence required to be able to share those very personal stories and and not everyone you know finds that so often they need to have people around them to surround them to give them that security and that safety to be able to do that more and more you know because not everyone is from you know a loving family who who would just go oh you know thank you for sharing you know oh my goodness they'll, they'll always feel devastated but they would be there for you well many people that's not their reality you know they're they're not they're not heard or not believed um or ostracized because of that and then that's really serious consequences I think mm. it's amazing what you're doing and I think that's incredible that when you said you know that's right that experience and I know that when I'm doing my biography it's so emotional it's so passionate oh. you know powerful unpacking your life and story that you finish it going oh I don't think I'd ever do anything again and then there you go three years later but that's it and that's because you've leaned into you know listening to that feedback there is more there is there is mm. more that people need to hear and um and definitely for us at this stage and for those who can look in and be you know i'm i bet you do that at your dance studio or in your businesses to actually be looking with with fresh eyes of noticeable changes in in um you know particularly teenagers young adults being able to sort of just be in tune with the the possibility that everything isn't all right and the earlier people find um are able to share that the better right you know why mm. why would any of us want people suffering for years and years before you know that that actually comes out so yeah and and absolutely you know um we have obviously a system in place to to, to monitor any situation uh, and you know I have like I say I have a team of people I don't particularly I'm not involved as much in the teaching side I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sort of sitting with my team on the management side but if anything is flagged I go I will deal with it straight away and and quite often than not when I when I deal with it and go to a parent or care or guardian there is a story behind the story so then we work out how to monitor and, and look after that child in our care mm -hmm. Um, and I do a lot of work with young people now going to schools and and raising awareness. And I remember last year before lockdown, I was working in a school, just did, I, I go and do sort of motivational work. And there was a little boy in the corner and, and he just looked sad the whole time I was there. And they were like, oh, that's just the way he is. Mm. And I, 
I remember saying, you need to get behind him a little bit more. And he said, well, he has a lot of therapy. He has a nice yeah, He needs more than that. You know, he, he needs to see empathy. He needs to see care. He needs to see love. And he clearly mm-hmm. isn't. He's just a, a very shy boy sat in the corner. And, 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 you know, my heart broke at what he may be going through. And you, can, you can't help everybody. But what we can do is share our voice, which can help everybody. You can't, mm-hmm. you can't, you know, there were so many broken people in this world and you're doing your bit, I'm doing my bit. We're all doing our bit to help put those pieces back together, but more than that, helping the next generation, which is really important. Um, so yeah, so there's definitely a, a system in place to recognize. And with all my work, you know, wherever I am in the world, obviously not not very far at the moment with COVID, but wherever I am, it's recognizing that. And even adults, you know, I now run a safe place on on social media called Breaking the Silence. Mm. And uh, it's just full of beautiful people. And all those beautiful people have gone, have been broken or maybe still are a bit broken. Mm. And it's a very open space to talk. And I, um, like I said, I run it, but the, 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 the people in that group really do, like work together to support each other and it's a beautiful thing because there's a lot of support out there it's just finding that place I would never have gone to Mm. this group I would never have called Samaritans I would never have you know I had a teacher who I used to speak to every week but I just cried for it every (laughs) week because Mm. she wasn't equipped she probably wasn't trained exactly Um, and and nowadays there is a lot more safeguarding there is a lot more um understanding but we need to go beyond that and like I say the work that I'm doing now so I work with a PR team I've got a new branding coming out I've got a new project coming up I've got a new book coming out and it this this next sort of 18 months 24 months is going to be a real big change and I'm very excited about it really excited because my businesses have gone on and on and on and on and on and now I'm I'm sort of at this point where I'm like this is where I need to be yeah, I, I can lateral, laterally step now and go, this is where I need to be. I've got, I've got everything around me that I absolutely enjoy, in, enjoy. But now it's about this is this is the heart. This is I think I've, I've done a lot of hard work. But now that yeah. now the gloves are really off. Yeah. Yeah. This is your soul work. <laughs> yes, exactly. So watch out world. Um Oh, I can't believe how the time has flown. Uh, it's been an amazing, yeah, amazing time chatting with you today. For those of uh, for those listeners who are listening in, going, oh my goodness, you know, you've sparked a lot of a um, lot of um, thoughts in their mind as to what what next. How did they find you, Emma Jane? Um, so my website is www.emmajanetaylor.life. If you go there, you'll see all my social media. I talk very openly on Twitter, Instagram about these subjects. And uh, you can find me on Facebook and there's contact details there as well. So everything you need is on my website, emmajanetaylor.life or emmajanetaylor.com will get you to, to me. And I, my ears are always open. I'm always here to listen. I'm always here to help and uh, do what I can to be the difference because people people need to know that they're not alone and that's really important for me Mm, fantastic and you can hear that through all of your sharing so those of you listening in uh definitely reach out to Emma Jane you know if you're actually you know you're hearing her authenticity you're hearing her heart uh in her sharing today and I assure you you will have such a warm welcome uh into her her arms and her team and being able to be told yeah what's the next step and where to from here and how you can get support and and not just support from her but from a whole community of people who actually do understand and do care Mm. and do value Mm. your voice so I encourage uh, you to do that listening in and I thank you so much Emma Jane for sharing your story with me today and I wish you all the very best in your future success thank you Annie it's been a pleasure to be here and I just wanted to end the interview today by saying my stepfather is now 84 years old Uh, he survived he's my best friend Mm. and uh, he's all I need And he's helped me understand the power of love, empathy, care, trust, respect, which has given me a a settled and happy future. And also I want to thank you, Annie. You're doing a great job and, you know, your work is, is very well received all around the world. So thank you for what you're doing as well. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. You know, we all do do what we can and it makes the world a better place. Right. So thank you so much, Emma Jane. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye Annie.
Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Memoirs of Successful Women. You can find me at anniegibbons.com where you can download my free resources, get connected on social and check out my online magic transformation program. If you love this show, feel free to subscribe to future episodes and of course, share it with your friends. I'll see you again soon and until then, happy podcasting.